Los continuos de los capítulos que están en las ciudades o que están por el libro. Los que están en las ciudades que están por el libro, solo el que no para dar el principio de los que es que es muy, muy bien, está todo el momento que le corté el libro a la vez que se hace a la vez. De después, y yo son el rey, so, no sé de en el final están con esta expresión de su historia. Con el lado de los tres, o de otro link, es muy bueno cuando vi las cosas. El ser de progreso en el documental que me dicen a ser serio, si son los tres, a la feliz. Si tres, en si son los tres, si fly the region at the base of the night, o son los lados, o de los tres. The sea flies must be flies to us laterally. On the superior aspect of the outstretched limb. The sea flies must be flies to us laterally on the sun. The sea seven must be flies to the middle and ring fingers and the middle of the superior surface of the limb. The CA supplies uh, the little finger, the middle side of the hand, and the forearm, which is the inferior aspect of the outstretched limb. The T1 nerve supplies the middle of the forearm to the axilla. The T2 nerve supplies a small part of the arm and the skin of the axilla. Most cutaneous nerves of the upper limb are derived from the brachial plexus, a major nerve network formed by the ventral rami of the fifth cervical to the first thora thoracic spinal nerve. The nerves to the shoulder, however, are derived from the cervical plexus, a nerve network consisting of a series of nerve loops formed between adjacent ventral primary rami of the first four cervical nerves, which also receives great communicating rami from the superior cervical ganglion. The cervical plexus lies deep to the sternocleidomastoid on the anterolateral aspect of the trunk. The cutaneous nerves of the arm and forearm are as follows. The supraclavicular nerve C3, C4 pass anterior to the clavicle, immediately deep to the platysma and supply the skin over the clavicle and the superlateral aspect of the pectoralis major. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm, branch of the radial nerve supplies the skin on the posterior surface of the arm. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm, also a branch of the radial nerve supplies the skin on the superior surface of the forearm. The superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, the terminal branch of the axillary nerve, emerges from beneath the posterior margin of the deltoid to supply skin over the lower part of this muscle on the lateral side of the mid-arm for a short distance anterior to its distal attachment to the lateral side of the arm a little above its middle. The inferior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, a branch of the radial nerve, supplies the skin over the inferolateral aspect of the arm. It is frequently a branch of the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, the terminal cutaneous branch of the muscular cutaneous nerve, supplies the skin on the lateral side of the forearm. The medial cutaneous nerve of the arm arises from the medial core of the brachial plexus uniting the axilla with the lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve and supplies the skin on the middle side of the arm. The intercostal brachial nerve and lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve of the two also contributes to the innervation of the skin on the middle surface of the arm. The medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm arises from the medial core of the brachial plexus and supplies the skin of the anterior and medial surfaces of the arm of the forearm. Note that like the brachial plexus, which has posterior, lateral, and medial, but not anterior cords, 
The upper limb has posterior, lateral, and medial, but no anterior cutaneous nerves. The superficial veins of the upper limb. The main superficial veins of the upper limb, the cephalic and basilic veins, originate in the subcutaneous tissue on the dorsum of the hand from the dorsal venous network. The perforating veins form communications between the superficial veins and the deep veins. The cephalic veins ascends from the lateral aspect of the dorsal venous network proceeding along the lateral border of the wrist and the anterolateral surface of the forearm and arm. Anterior to the elbow, it communicates with the media uh, cubital vein, which passes obliquely across the anterior aspect of the elbow and joins the basilic vein. Superiorly, the cephalic vein courses along the deltopectoral groove between the deltoid and pectoralis major and enters the deltopectoral triangle, where it pierces the clavicopectoral fascia, uh, which is also known as costocoracoid membrane, and joins the axillary vein. The basilic vein ascends from the medial end of the dorsal venous network along the medial side of the forearm and the inferior part of the arm. It pass, passes deeply, piercing the brachial dysphasia and runs superiorly parallel to the brachial artery to the axilla, where it merges with the accompanying veins, which are also known as venae comitantes of the axillary artery to the form the axillary vein. The highly variable and commonly absent medial anterobrachial vein begins at the base of the dorsum of the thumb, curves around the lateral side of the breast, ascends in the middle of the anterior aspect of the forearm between the cephalic and basilic veins and might join the basilic vein in the cubital fossa. Sometimes the medial antebrachial vein divides into intermediate, which is median, cephalic and basilic veins, which drain into the cephalic and, and basilic veins, respectively, and might replace the medial cubital vein when located on the anterior aspect of the elbow. The lymphatic drainage of the upper limb, the superficial lymphatic vessels arise from lymphatic flexors in the digit form and dorsum of the hand and descend mostly with superficial veins such as the cephalic and basilic veins. Some vessels are accompanying the basilic vein entering the cubital nodes. Located proximal to the medial epicondyle and medial to the basilic vein, efferent vessels from this lymph nodes ascend in the arm and terminate in the humeral or laterally axillary lymph nodes. Most lymphatic vessels accompanying the cephalic vein cross the proximal part of the arm and anterior aspect of the shoulder to enter the apical group of axillary nodes. However, some vessels pro uh, previously enter the deltopectoral nodes. Deep lymphatic vessels less numerous than superficial vein accompany the major deep veins in the upper limb and also terminate in the humeral group of axillary nodes. The anterior thoracopendicular muscles of the upper limb, four anterior thoracopendicular pectoral muscles, move the pectoral girdle, pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, subclavius, and serratus anterior. The attachment nerve supply and main action of these muscles are given. Right. Uh, which means that take a look in your atlas, right? Uh, um, the, the nerve supply, right? And, and the muscles that are around, right? Uh, the pectoral is major. The large and fan shape covers the superior part of the thorax. It has clavicular and sternocostal heads. The lateral head is much lar larger and its lateral border is responsible for the muscular mass that forms most of the anterior wall of the axilla, where its inferior border forming the anterior axilla fold. The pectoralis major and adjacent deltoid form the narrow deltopectoral group in which the cephalic vein runs, however, they divide 
slightly from each other superiorly and along with the clavicle form the deltopectoral triangle. The pectoralis major is a powerful abductor, abductor of the arm and a medial rotator of the humerus. The two parts of the pectoralis major can act independently. The clavicular head flexing the humerus and the sternocostal head extending it, right? The, uh, uh, if acting normally, the clavicular head can be seen and palpated. Right. To test the sternal head of the pectoralis major, the arm is raised 60 degrees. Right. To test the clavicular head of the pectoral major, the arm is abducted 90 degrees. And then abducted against resistance, if acting normally, the sternocostal head can be seen and palpated. The pectoralis minor lies in the anterior wall of the axilla, where it is largely covered by the much larger pectoralis major. The pectoralis minor is, is triangular in shape. Is its base uh, is formed by fleshy slip attachments to the anterior end of the third through fifth rib near their costal cartilage. Its apex is on the coracoid process of the scapula. Variation in the costal attachments of the muscle are common. The pectoralis minor stabilizes the scapula and is used when stretching the arm forward to touch an object that is just out of reach. The pectoralis minor also assists in elevating the wrist for deep inspiration when the pectoral girdle is fixed or elevated. The pectoralis minor is a useful anatomical and surgical landmark for structures in the axilla. With the coracoid process, the pectoralis minor forms a bridge under which vessels and nerves must pass, must pass to the arm. The subclavius lies almost horizontal when the arm is in the anatomical position. The small round muscle is located inferior to the clavicle and affords some pro protection to the subclavial artery. When the clavicle fractures, it might also prevent the, the jag and or a, a fractured clavicle from injuring the adjacent subclavian vessels and the superior trunk of the brachial plexus. The subclavius anchors and depresses the clavicle, it stabilizes it during movement of the upper limb. It also helps resist the tendency for the clavicle to dislocate at the SC joint, for example, when pulling hard during a, a talk of war game. The cerebral anterior overlies the lateral part of the thorax and forms the middle wall of the axilla. This broad sheet of thick muscle was named because of the soft root tooth, tooth appearance of its fleshy slips of the digitations. The muscular slips pass posteriorly and then medially to converge on the whole length of the anterior surface of the medial borders of the scapula, including its inferior angle. The serratus anterior, one of the most powerful muscles of the pectoral girdle, is a stone protractor of the scapula that is used when uh, punching or reaching anteriorly. Some people call it the boxer's muscle. Its strong inferior part rotates the scapula, elevating its glenoid cavity to the arm can be raised above the shoulder. By keeping the scapula closely applied to the thoracic wall, it anchors this flat bone, enabling other muscles to use it as a fixed bone for movements of the humerus. The serratus anterior pulls the scapula against the thoracic wall when doing push up or when pushing against resistance. Right? Thus, to rest, to test the serratus anterior. The hand of the outstretched limb is pushed against the wall. If the muscle is acting normally, uh, you, you will be able to see a digitation 
of the moss can be seen and palpated. Take a look in your atlas, right? The wing scapula, right? Take a look at the <coughs> the thoracoappendicular muscles, right? The posterior thoracoappendicular and scapular humeral muscles. Uh, um, known as superficial and intermediate groups of stretching back muscles attach the superior appendicular skeleton of the upper limb to the axial skeleton in the trunk the intrinsic back muscles which maintain postures and control movements of the vertebral column are this uh, have been described already right in the in the other chapter right the uh, right and, and uh, the shoulder muscles are divided into three groups. The superficial posterior thoracoappendicular, which is known as extrinsic shoulder muscles, trapezius and latissimus dorsi. The deep posterior thoracoappendicular, which is the extrinsic shoulder muscles, the levator, scapulae, and rhomboids. The scapulo humeral, which is the intrinsic shoulder, muscles, deltoid, that is major, and four rotator cuff muscles. The superficial posterior thoracoappendicular strings in shoulders muscles uh, are the trapezius, the latissimus dorsi. The attachments, nerve supply, and main actions of these muscles, right, uh, are the, let us just explain the trapezius provides a direct attachment of the pectoral girdle to the trunk. This large triangular muscle covers the posterior astro of the neck and the posterior half of the trunk. It was given its name because the muscle of the two sides form a trapezius. And the trapezius attaches the pectoral girdle to the scope and vertebral column and assists in suspending the upper limb. The fibers of the trapezius are divided into three parts that have different actions at the conceptual scapulo thoracic joint between the scapula and the thoracic wall. The superior fibers elevate the scapula. And this is when squaring the shoulders. The milk fibers retract the scapula which is pull it posteriorly. Take a look in your atlas, the trapezius muscles, and take a look in your atlas, the latissimus dorsi muscles, right? And we're talking about the middle fibers, retract the scapula, right? And which is pulling posteriorly, and the inferior fibers depress the scapula and lower the shoulder. The trapezius also braces the shoulder by pulling the scapula posteriorly and superiorly fixing them in position on the thoracic wall with tonic contraction, consequently weakness of this muscle causes dropping of the shoulders. Superior and inferior trapezius fibers act together in rotating the scapula on the thoracic wall in different directions, twisting it like a wing nut. Right. And uh, the shoulder is shrugged against resistance, right? Uh, when the patient attempts to raise the shoulder as the physician or physician therapist presses down on them. In fact, normally the superior border of the muscle can be easily seen and palpated. The latissimus dorsi, the, uh, which means widest of the back, was well chosen because it covers a wide area of the back. It's a thin, large, fan-shaped muscle passes from the trunk to the humerus and acts directly on the glenohumeral joint and indirectly on the pectoral girdle, which is also known as scapulothoracic joint. The latissimus dorsi extends, retracts, and rotates the humerus medially, right? It says, that is happening when holding the arms behind the back or scratching the skin over the, the opposite scapula. 
in combination with the pectoralis major, the latissimus dorsi is a powerful abductor of the humerus. It is also useful in restoring the upper limb from abduction. Superior to the shoulders, hence the latissimus dorsi is the important climbing muscle. In conjunction with the pectoralis majors, the latissimus dorsi raises the trunk to the arm, which occurs when perforating chin up, which is hosting oneself on an overhead bar or climbing a tree. From example, these movements are also used when chopping wood, uh, paddling a canoe, and swimming, particularly during the, the crow stroke. The test of uh, the arm is abducted 90 degrees and then adopted against resistance provided by the stamina. In fact, normally the anterior border of the muscle can be seen and easily palpated in the posterior axillary fold. The muscle can also be felt to contract when a person is asked to cough. The, the deep perpendicular, which is also known as extrinsic shoulder muscles, are the elevator scapula and rhomboids. These muscles provide direct attachments of the appendicular skeleton to the axial skeleton. The attachments that are supplied are also can be seen right in the atlas. Take a look at the posterior view, right? and the rhomboid muscles posterior view, the deipole muscles, the levator scapula muscles for the posterior view. The levator scapula, third of the strap-like levator scapula lies deep to the senocleidomastoid, the inferior third is deep to the trapezius. From the tarbes process of the upper cervical vertebrae, the fibers of the levator scapula pass inferiorly to the supermedial border of the scapula, right? Uh, true to its name, the elevator scapula elevates the and rotates the scapula, depressing the glenoid cavity, tilting it inferiorly. It also assists in retracting the scapula and fixing it against the trunk and flexing the neck laterally, right? Uh, the rhomboids, the two Rhomboid muscles not always clearly separated from each other have a rhomboid appearance. They form an oblique equilateral parallelogram. The rhomboid major and minor lie deep to the trapezius and form broad parallel bands that pass interlaterally from the vertebrae to the media border of the scapula. The thin flat rhomboid major is approximately two times wider than the thicker rhomboid minor lying superior to it. The rhomboids retract and rotate the scapula, depressing its plenal cavity. They also assist in ser serratus anterior in holding the scapula against the thoracic wall and fixing the scapula during movements of the upper limb. The rhomboids are used when forcibly lowering the raised upper limbs. Uh, the, uh, right. the patient is asked to place the hands posterior on, on the hips and to push the elbows posteriorly against resistance providing by the examiner. If the rhomboid or are acting normally, uh, they can be palpated along middle borders of the scapula. Because they lie deep to the trapezius, the rhomboids are not always visible during testing. The scapulohumeral, uh, which is also known as the intrinsic shoulder muscles. The six scapulohumeral muscles, deltoid, teres, major, supraspinatus, infras, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor, are relatively short muscles uh, passing from the scapula to the humerus and act on the glenohumeral shoulder joint. The attachments, nerve supply, and main action of these intrinsic shoulder muscles right, can be seen also in the atlas. The deltoid is a thick, powerful, coarse texture muscle 
covering the shoulder and forming its rounded contour. Its name indicates the delta is shaped like the inverted Greek letter delta. The muscle is divided into unipenate anterior and posterior parts and a multipenate middle part. The parts of the deltoid can act separately and as whole well when all these parts contract simultaneously. The arm is abducted. The anterior and posterior parts act like guide ropes to steady the arm and it is abducted. Right. To initiate movements during the first and fifteenth of abduction degrees, the deltoid is assisted by the supraspinate. When the arm is full adopt the line of the the line of pull of the deltoid coinciding with the axis of the humerus, thus it pulls directly upwards on the bone and cannot initiate or produce abduction. However, able to act as a shunt muscle, resisting inferior displacement of the head of the humerus from the glenoid cavity, as when lifting and carrying suitcases or buckets of water from the fully abducted position, abduction must be initiated by the supraspinatus or by uh, leaning to the side, allowing gravity to do so. Uh, right. Deltoid becomes fully effective as an abductor following the initial 15 degrees of abduction. The anterior and superior parts of the deltoids are used to, to swing the limbs during walking. The anterior parts assist the pectoralis major in flexing the arm, and the posterior part assists the latissimus dorsi in extending the arm. Deltoid also helps stabilize the shoulder joint and hold the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity during arm movement. Right. To test the deltoid or the function of the axillary nerve that supplies it, the arm is when it's abducted, starting from the approximately 15 degrees against resistance, right? In fact, normally the muscle can easily be seen and palpated. The influence of gravity is avoided when the person is supine. Let us continue uh, a little bit later with a little bit more of this chapter.